All right. Oh, Greg, thank you so much for putting in yesterday's YouTube recording. We'll have that listed on our Starnet website as well. So let's see, we're live on YouTube. We are recording, we are good to go. Um, and Gina, yeah, w Gina, would you send me an email afterwards? I do realize I had the wrong link in the Survey Monkey yesterday. Um, so I can totally get that to you. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Doug. There's Greg. Greg is behind the scenes. He's going to be dropping in links. Um, and we are, yeah, ready to go. I guess we'll go All ahead right. and introduce ourselves. Awesome. Thank you guys for joining us again. Uh, those of you who were here with us yesterday, we had a great time and now we're here for round two. So um, today we have five of us facilitating. Um, my name is Claire Ratcliffe. I am one of the education coordinators here at the Space Science Institute. And I am Brooks Mitchell. I'm an education coordinator here at the Space Science Institute as well. We run the StarNet project. Um, I guess technically we're at the National Center for Interactive Learning at the Space Science Institute. Yes. I'm Beatrice. Yep, Beatrice has been doing a lot of behind the scenes work, keeping our clearinghouse up and running, um, adding new activities every day. And now we are up to 365 activities, uh, which is really awesome. You can do one hands-on STEM activity a day for a whole year if you want to, thanks to Beatrice. So thank you for that. And I am Eric Strochane at the North Dakota State Library. Hi there, this is Ty Hutchinson with the Girls Who Code. Super excited to meet with everyone and chat some more today about how, how we can help. Awesome. Thanks, guys. So what we have in store for you today after this welcome, we're going to do a quick recap of what we did yesterday, um, basically defining computational thinking um, and how it is not just something that you need for computers, uh, but something that you can do off computers as well. Uh, we have our guest presenter, Eric, um, from North Dakota here to tell you all about how he has incorporated plugged activities um, very successfully in library settings. Um, next, we'll have two activity demonstrations. Um, one is called Codable. This is for your pre-reader patrons. You do not have to have any reading skills to be able to code with these activities. It is a web-based platform, so you do need to have computers and internet, so hence the plugged in portion, but it's a great way to start with beginner coding. Next, we'll show you Solar System, which is a more advanced coding, so maybe for your middle school students or above um, that are interested in learning some coding languages. Um, it, it's still a block coding language, but it starts to introduce you to JavaScript, so we'll walk you through that. and. Finally, uh, we'll have Ty again. She was with us yesterday, but she's going to close this out with some of the plugged in resources that Girls Who Code have. And yeah, we'll close if there's time at the end with a quick plug in our clearinghouse that we've already discussed a little bit. And if again, if there's time, any questions you guys have, we'll have a discussion there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, when we get to questions, you're welcome just to put them in the chat box. You might have a better chance of, you know, getting your question addressed if you do it in that Q&A box. So it should be at the bottom of your toolbar. It just says Q&A. So at some point, if you have a question, if you want to make sure it doesn't get lost in the chat box, just do it in that Q&A. Definitely. And one more reminder with that, just please make sure that you're sending it to all panelists and attendees, um, the not just all panelists just so everyone can be aware of what you're posting and there can be more meaningful dialogue between everybody. All right, so we're gonna start off with a poll question. Um, I'm going to launch it. So you'll actually have a box pop up that has um, things you can click on for your answers and you can choose all that, that apply. But the question is, in what ways do you most commonly use computers? Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and launch that for you all in a minute. Mm -hmm. I might be able to launch it on my end. Clear. Yeah, that'd be great. Actually, here it is. I got it. Okay. Launch polling. We'll give you about 10 seconds, maybe 15 seconds. Um, please choose all that apply to you. In what ways do you most commonly use computers? Awesome, I'm seeing the answers come in. This is really interesting. It is. Okay, I'm gonna give you three more seconds to make any changes. Three, two, one. Okay, and I'm gonna go ahead and share these results. I find them really interesting. <laughs> so it looks like most, the most common answers are 
social media and communications like email um, and research. That's, I would say, what I mostly use it for. A lot with the online library catalog. I expected that to be mm -hmm. kind of high with you guys. Um, watching shows or movies is probably, besides work, my main <laughs> way of using my computer. Um, lower on the video games. I do expect that from a bunch of librarians, probably more interested in, I don't know, reading books. Maybe? I've, met some, I've met some librarian gamers. Okay, okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I'm actually surprised, yeah, 36 say coding and programming. That's actually a little higher than I was expecting. Um, my main point of putting this poll out there is we use computers for all kinds of things. Um, and oftentimes, at least what I've seen in my personal life, um, I usually use it as a tool for things that already exist. So I'm using platforms that somebody else has programmed like Facebook or Google. Um, but computers are so much more than that. You know, once you really dig into computational thinking and computer science, you can use computers as a tool to create your own world. Um, so that's kind of what we're gonna get into today and how we can engage our patrons to be creators of their products rather than just consumers. So thank you guys so much for engaging in that. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and share the screen again. And we'll jump back into it. Okay. <clears throat> All right, so yesterday we talked a lot about what is computational thinking. This is a big buzzword that we're hearing in schools, we're hearing um, in science communities. Um, and we, we discussed it for a little bit. And basically, I, I took this slide from um, bits and pieces from ALA's Libraries Ready to Code definition of computational thinking. Um, and I broke it down into my three things that I really turned to. So basically, computational thinking really has, you do not need to have a computer to engage in computational thinking. Rather, it's a thought process that you use to consider problems and their, their solutions. And the way that you do that is you decompose problems into smaller pieces to solve, or like I, I like to say, divide and conquer looking for patterns and identifying causes and effects and using algorithmic thinking or creating a series of instructions to solve problems. Um, and again, making explicit things humans do implicitly without even realizing that they're doing it. So like we said yesterday, our brains are little computers. Before computers were built, we called humans computers because we were the ones solving problems by using um, algorithmic thinking and breaking things down into smaller pieces so that we can solve large complex problems. Um, this was a slide from yesterday, but if you weren't here, I just wanna quickly go over the importance of computational thinking skills. So all of those things, recognizing patterns, looking for cause and effect, setting up instructions that you can uh, follow to solve a problem, help our patrons with confidence in dealing with complexity, persistence in working with difficult problems, the ability to deal with open-ended problems, ability to communicate and work with others to achieve a common goal or solution. And my very favorite is enabling our kids to be creators rather than just consumers of technology. So if you're working with a group of tweens and they are full on gamers, they love playing games, they love Fortnite and all the popular things out there, that's awesome. Harness that interest and turn it around so that you know, you give them a platform where they can create their own game. Um, or if they love art or music, there's ways, um, there's platforms that we'll talk about today that allow your patrons to code specific music or specific art and patterns. Um, we saw, we observed a library program recently where kids were coding fashion. Um, they were creating avatars and they were finding different patterns for their clothes. Um, and it was incredible just to see how that librarian was able to really harness the interest of her patrons um, and help them develop that interest by introducing computational thinking skills. So these are this is just a great thing to get into and I really appreciate all of you guys for your interest and for joining us to learn more about how you can bring that to your library. All right, and at that I'm gonna pass it off to Eric um, to talk a little bit about what he's done in starting coding clubs at his library. All right. Hello again, everybody. My name is Eric Strohshane, and I am the, oops, starting my video. <laughs> 
I am the library development manager at the North Dakota State Library, which basically means that I supervise a department of really awesome people who are responsible for continuing education and consultation to public and school librarians statewide. Um, since North Dakota's libraries are predominantly underfunded, part of what we do is develop programming uh, materials and circulating kits so that even in towns serving you know fewer than 100 people libraries can provide the sorts of services that patrons would expect from a much larger community's library um, among other things this means we have spent an inordinate amount of time in the past couple of years playing with robots because my job is awesome all right Hmm. The next slide. Um, hmm. Let's just one second, quick? Eric. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So for those of you who have never seen it, which I expect is all of you given the population and tourism numbers, this is what North Dakota looks like. Um, it is a vast and uninhabited expanse comprised almost entirely of grass, canola, bees, cows, and firearms. Um, I appreciate that living in a remote and uninhabited prairie does not fundamentally qualify me to speak about running code clubs in your library. So I do wanna talk a little bit about things that um, I've done and that we've done here at the State Library um, to assist libraries and librarians with CSE instruction. Uh, back in 2014, the Illinois State Library invited us to be part of the 2015 Innovative Librarians Explore, Apply, and Discover cohort, also known as ILEAD. I Lead North Dakota was a nine month long library leadership institute that was focused on collaborative problem solving through technology. Um, part of what we did was teach courses on things like JavaScript, Excel formulas, um, using Arduinos and Makey Makeys, um, and little bits and other fun things, um, all of which were received with a heady mix of joy and terror from the librarians who were attending. Um, significantly, some of what we did incidentally wound up planting the seeds for intentional computational thinking instruction through public libraries in our state. Um, just by getting library leaders engaging and talking to others about their ILEAD experiences. Now, in case it's not clear, North Dakota tends to be a bit behind the curve in terms of technology adoption in a few other ways. Um, true story, one of the library directors I work with uh, told me with pride that she was finally bringing her library into the 20th century. Uh, I decided that this was a painfully accurate statement and did not correct her and instead focused on trying to help her aim, you know, one century higher. At the North Dakota State Library, um, the next initiative that we got involved in on coding education was called CODAC. Uh, NODAC is kind of a local shorthand for North Dakota. so. We thought it was vaguely clever. Uh, and this was just a push to get schools and libraries statewide uh, embracing CSE, because we didn't have, um, until this semester that's starting right now, we did not have any kind of formal computer science curriculum in the state, uh, just approved, just implemented. Um, so the school focus was there, but we're also looking at the public libraries. And anyhow, so we wanted you know, CSE, we wanted libraries and schools in the hour of code, and we wanted to get code clubs up and running. All right, we advance this agenda primarily through articles in our monthly newsletter, but also at you know every in-person speaking presentation opportunity we were able to land. Uh, and we really started to get traction at our summer summit meetings in 2017, which are basically day-long trainings we do for library administrators. And we made everyone there go through an hour of code. Uh, we wouldn't give them lunch otherwise, so that helped. Uh, and then afterwards, we let them play with spheros. Uh, if you aren't familiar with those, they're basically these rigid plastic robotic balls that people dash against my feet when I speak to them for an hour. Uh, and, you know, it was great. We got dozens of North Dakota library directors to finally surmount their fears 
and reservations and realize that they not only can, but totally should be doing this sort of thing in their libraries. And that once you start, it's no longer scary. It's just really, really fun. So around the same time, we got a grant to create STEM programming kits uh, through what's called Air Force STEM. Uh, and this was done in partnership with the Grand Forks Air Force Base School Liaison Office. And they basically gave us funding to put together kits that we could circulate to school and public libraries statewide. We wound up assembling 42 of these and they contain things like Ozobots and Spheros and Codybots and Cosmos, uh, Code and Go robot mice, giant polydrons, uh, Robot Wars board games, rolly musical instruments, um, oh, in telescopes, uh, which I really don't recommend because these are such a pain in the butt to ship, uh, but they are really cool. Um, so truth be told, maybe I'd do it again, but you shouldn't. If you have the opportunity, you shouldn't do telescopes. Um, all right, next slide. Can I advance it? Mm. I don't seem to be able to advance the slide. Oop. There we go. Okay. So currently I am the project director for Coding at Every Library, which is an Institute of Museum and Library Services grant funded endeavor that uh, supports and studies year long weekly code clubs at 50 small and rural libraries nationwide. We had 300 libraries apply to be part of this project, which was remarkable and honestly pretty surprising given the short turnaround that we had from advertising and opening the application window to actually starting to review the applications that we received. Um, fingers crossed, we are hoping to get a supplement and extension to this grant. Uh, we'll find out within the next couple of weeks. And if we do, then we'll be able to add another 50 libraries to it. Um, the images in this slide, yeah, that, that was not me in the dinosaur costume. <laughs> I have never been in one of those. I, I would love to, but no, that was not me. Um, <laughs> thank you, chat. Uh, yeah, so th these images were actually all, show all shared from participating libraries. We have a Facebook group set up for them. Um, and there is just, like, I see these and there's just so much to love. Um, like at the State Library, I'm kind of always a step or two removed from like the actual results of what I'm doing. So it's great to see things like this shared back. Uh, but yeah, one of the things that we discovered is just that a library code club can look a whole lot of different ways. Like there is no one way to run these. There's no prescribed size. There's no kind of perfect setting. Um, you just need space, computers, internet access and kids or, or adults like adult coding clubs are a thing and they're awesome too. You can totally run those. Um, but one thing that's clear just from looking at these images is that code clubs teach way more than computing skills. Um, like that's arguably the least important thing that they'll develop. Uh, 21st century skills like creativity, problem solving, communication, and collaboration are just really demonstrably at the core of computer science education. And then if we can advance the next slide, please. Eric, I think you might be able to. Okay, okay. <laughs> it's, it's a little fidgety. Right. Um, there we go. Thanks. Okay, so um, suffering is the difference between how things are and how we wish them to be, or at least that's what my therapist has told me. Um, and the last thing I want is for any of you to suffer. So I'm gonna go through some of the pain points that we discovered when working to instantiate code clubs in libraries. Um, and some of the ways that, you know, you can really work to bridge that difference between what you're hoping to do and operant reality. So the first pain point I kind of already mentioned, and that's fear, but you folks are here. So you're probably in a really good place in that regard already in terms of, you know, your feelings towards coding generally, but just in case you aren't, um, I just really highly recommend going to hourofcode.com, forcing yourself to go through. Um, yes, there is a list of those kits on our website and we've also put together coding materials. Sorry, I, I catch chat occasionally out of my eye. Um, yeah, if you go to library.nd.gov, 
Um, we do have uh, support materials for all of our kits, and then all of our kits are uh, available. You, you can look at the contents in KitKeeper, which is the circulation system we use for those. You won't be able to check them out unless you're in North Dakota, but you can at least find out what's in them. Um, yeah, so, so getting past fear, go to hourofcode.com, just force yourself to go through at least an hour of this. Um, you know, pick Moana, pick whatever Disney character you most want to work with. Thank you. Thank you for sharing the link. Um, and just, just get into it, do it. Um, you will find that you are capable of this. I guarantee it. Uh, oh, and a footnote to that, um, just based on how fun this is and how approachable it really is. Uh, a study of high school students done by Change the Equation and C plus R Research found that students enjoy computer science and the arts significantly more than all other fields with computer science coming in third behind art and design and the performing arts and well ahead of fourth place English, which hurts me a little bit, but you know, whatever. That's two degrees that I'm apparently flushing down the toilet. Um, but an important takeaway from this and something that is often misunderstood is that computer science genuinely has a home among the liberal arts. Um, despite potentially high levels of abstraction, it's fundamentally both a linguistic and a creative field. Uh, it's also increasingly prevalent among, well, all of the arts like film, photography, music, animation, design, architecture, sculpture, fashion, composition, probably culinary arts. Um, so if you're nervous, don't get hung up on the technology part, just embrace the creativity side of it. Uh, the second pain point that we encountered a surprising amount was a lack of local support. Um, we've run into some libraries where the director wanted to start a code club, but their library board felt that that did not belong in the public library. And it was something that should be done only through the schools. Um, so if this is a problem you run into, uh, a resource I'd recommend is code.org slash promote. They've got really great kind of, you know, up to the moment stats that you can tap into and utilize. Um, they have good visualizations of those as well. And you can uh, customize those to the state level. Uh, and they also have a like a full PowerPoint presentation that you can take and give if that's what you want to do. Uh, of course, partnering with schools is another option that I, I like to recommend. Um, so, you know, keep that in mind. The third pain point that we really frequently encountered um, is just issues with promoting it. Um, like once you and your board have recognized this is what you want to do and you've built up the courage to do it, you also need to spread the word in a way that works. Um, parents want their kids enrolled in things like this. Kids will enjoy the heck out of things like this and they'll want their friends enrolled with them. Um, but none of these folks will likely know that you offer coding at the library or suspect that you do. And you may not have the best words, images, videos, uh, or marketing staff at your disposal. So there are resources out there, uh, Prenda, which is a group that we're working with through the Coding at Every Library project, developed a bunch of these. Um, Code.org has some, uh, and also very significantly, Girls Who Code have just simply amazing resources as well. Um, whenever I go out and do a presentation like this, I always really push Girls Who Code because it is literally the easiest way to start a code club at your library. Um, I think they're absolutely amazing, and it's wonderful that we have Ty here today, uh, who's going to speak with you a little later on. Um, okay. Hey, next slide. So that is all well and good, but you're not a robot. You are not a mechanically inexhaustible, ruthlessly efficient librarian machine, at least I assume. Um, subsequently, you just cannot do everything alone. Uh, even if your library, <laughs> Lisa can, um, even if your library can't afford support staff, uh, you know, there are ways of getting assistance with this and resources you can tap into. Um, again, the, the group that we've been working with, Prenda, developed a few really nice um, guides 
uh, guidebooks on, on how to go about this. They have one on recruiting and retaining volunteers that you can access from their site. And they also have a guide on working to um, get kids to just kind of keep coming back to your club. And this is clutch because some of the best help that you're going to get is actually going to be from these uh, recurrent code club attendees. Uh, they love sharing this stuff. They're going to be there to help out newcomers to your club and to answer some of the coding questions that you probably won't be able to. Uh, they are also awesome word of mouth advertising, and they can be surprisingly effective advocates for your library within your community. Um, it's also worth noting that the kids you'll be working with are not themselves robots, so you may want to consider feeding them. Um, it's kind of the universal solution to low programming numbers, <laughs> pizza. So like, don't be shy about doing that, especially if you can get your friend's group to pony up for some. Um, it's just a good way to get people in the door. Uh, eat first, code later. And don't be shy about celebrating the kids who come in. Um, a fun and easy way of just kind of shining recognition on attendees that emerged from one of the libraries we've been working with uh, and is just kind of filtered through and become a staple for our other participating libraries nationwide is to have a coder of the week. And this is super, super easy. Um, basically, if you have like a big screen TV or a way of projecting to a screen or something, um, you can hook that kid's work up so that they are projecting broadcasting live to a place where people elsewhere in the library can witness it. Um, this is just a really cool way of having their work displayed, of celebrating what they're doing, um, of advertising and raising interest in like other kids getting into the club and of raising community awareness of the awesome stuff that you're doing. Um, it's also just another way of encouraging young coders to come back next week, um, just in hopes that you know, they'll be the coder of the week next time. Um, as a side note, it's important not to do this on a merit basis, just to kind of keep a rotation. All right. So another thing that I'm sure you've recognized you'll need is curriculum. And that's likely not something you'll feel comfortable coming up with on your own. It's certainly not something I would expect you to do or anticipate many libraries to do. Um, I was tempted to have this listed as pain point number four a bit earlier, but I did wanna keep the slides moving a little bit. Uh, so here are some, some places you can turn to for really great curriculum. Uh, so code.org, uh, they're the group that started Hour of Code but they also have much more detailed and protracted lessons you can tap into. Uh, they've got self-paced curricula for ages four through 18 and up, like I've taken a lot of these and I'm older than pants. So like it's really kind of all inclusive, just kind of filter in at whatever level you're comfortable. Uh, Prenda, just kind of going around counterclockwise. Uh, there are coding at every library partner. Now, this is the one group that actually does charge that I'm listing here, but, and I'm not here to hawk product or to push you to that, um, but it's worth mentioning that they also have a philanthropical side. So for every library that actually enrolls, like pays for their service, they will sign up another one for free. So they have a waiting list that you can get on for this, for their um, give one, get one program. Uh, and I don't know that it's very widely known, you know, possibly until now. So get out there, it's worth pursuing. We've had libraries in our state um, get basically a year worth, year's worth of free fully supported coding club at their library through them. So that's kind of cool. Code Club International is the next one on here. And they've got a lot of really cool feature, like, project-based courses, um, and they have them in a wide array of languages um, and like human, real life human languages, not computer language, well, both, but like they've got a lot of different human spoken languages for all of their <laughs> curriculum. So if that's a need that you have, this is a really nice way that you can meet that quite easily. 
Um, and then I'm never sure how to pronounce it, um, if it's Kano or Kano, but K-A-N-O is, uh, in addition to really, really cool educational products that they make, like they have, like kind of their flagship one was a build your own computer, even if you're but a small child, uh, which is an awesome kit. And they also did a, a like a build your own high definition monitor that you can just assemble if you're a kid or a, so really cool stuff, but they also have excellent free and standards aligned curricula on their site. Well, it's kind of a partner site. It's world.kano.me. So just another fun place you can turn. Um, theirs is mostly, I think entirely block-based. So um, maybe a little earlier than some of the others in terms of when you'd approach it. Uh, and then last, but certainly not least, and actually, you know, front and center in my presentation is Girls Who Code, which Ty is gonna be talking to you about in just a little bit. Um, uh, aside, if you are thinking about doing an adult code club, then a resource that you might wanna check out for that is called Code Academy. Uh, I've taken a lot of classes through them, learned quite a bit. They do some, like, you know, it's good workforce development as well as just kind of fundamental coding stuff. Okay. These are two of my very, very favorites. Um, they are very special, very free, and they completely rule. But as coding environments go, they are um, maybe a bit more advanced than the other ones that I've been directing you to. Uh, but they are really versatile, robust, um, and they just positively call out for experimentation with them. Uh, so these will really help engage uh, budding creative artists curious about using computers in their projects. Um, Sonic Pi, which is from the University of Cambridge, is a computer programming language designed for making sounds and songs. And you can do this across like the full gamut of musical styles. Uh, and they've got a complete tutorial. They have a comprehensive manual. They have a lot of one-off coding lessons, and then they have a full 11 week course that you can take for free. So it's a really amazing way to learn or teach coding through the joy of music. Um, open Processing on the other side of the screen is a coding platform for visual design. Uh, they've got an emphasis on making animated, interactive, and procedurally generated artwork. Um, it's easy to dig in and start experimenting with this really eyeball stunning platform. And while they don't support any manner or like have any manner of formal curriculum, um, visual artists might actually appreciate just the openness and lack of structure. Uh, and they have a huge library of really cool interactive projects and they kind of, you know, focus on new ones each day, like highlight them on their, on their page. Uh, and you can view these and alter the source code and watch how it changes the artwork just live. It's really beautiful. Okay. There we go. Okay. So the last thing I want to say is that children of all ages love robots um, and they love you too, even though you're not one. So we have seen really, really incredible responses to robots from like really, really young kids to like nursing homes when libraries have brought them in. So if you are willing and able to invest a bit, um, I can honestly say these will help augment and really build interest in the sorts of computational thinking programs that you're doing at your library. Uh, alternatively, if you can't afford them, there might be a lending source in your state, um, just like the State Library of North Dakota circulates these out, check with your state library. If they don't do it, they might know of like a university, a science museum or institute that does. So, you know, it does not hurt to ask. The, the worst thing that can happen when you ask is they'll say no. Uh, so yeah, things that we've done to good effect, I guess I already listed these, but like Spheros, Ozobot, Bits and Evos, Codibots, Cosmos, uh, Code and Go, Robot Mice are super fun, uh, many others. And yeah, as I mentioned earlier, the support materials that we developed for our STEM kits are available on our site. Um, that was my last plug. 
Uh, so now I am very happy to turn things over to our beautiful friends at the Space Science Institute. Um, but please, please, please don't hesitate to reach out. I love talking about this stuff that's probably apparent. Uh, so yeah, um, send, me, send me emails, send me chat. I'll look at that and see what I can respond to. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Eric. That was awesome. I didn't expect to laugh so much. <laughs> thank you. Um, yeah, and um, just so you guys all know that link bank that we periodically keep dropping in the chat has most of the links um, to the resources that Eric was referring to. So Code and Go robots, Ozobots, many of the robots are linked on there, as well as code.org and lots of those support resources. So check that out. Um, I thought I would take some time to walk you through some of these online resources and just show you how easy it is to facilitate them. Um, so this first one is one called Codable. Um, this is a beginner coding program and it is also for pre-readers. There's no requirement to have to read anything. So I used to use this program with my kindergartners back when I was a public school teacher. Um, it uses drag and drop coding or as you heard Eric referring to block coding and it has a self-guided tutorial. So even with preschoolers or kindergartners, as long as you get them started and you have it up on their computer for them, they can really go through it, maybe walk through the first stage together, but this is something they can do on their own. So if you have a large group of, of patrons, you're really more of a facilitator guide on the side rather than having to um, directly take that direct instruction approach. And it also promotes that algorithmic thinking that we talked about earlier uh, because it has your patrons create step-by-step -step instructions to solve missions. Um, and you can get to that on code.org slash learn. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and open that up. I'm gonna have to switch my share screen. So um, Eric mentioned this website quite a bit and I want you to just see how easy it is to navigate. Many of you probably already use this. So if this is old news, I apologize, but I wanted to make sure everyone felt confident in using these resources. So if you go to code.org slash learn, it has all types of activities from various sources. Some of them are from scratch. Some of them are from CS Ed, um, many of them on Tinker, but it's all kind of put together here um, sort of in an online anthology, if you will, of different resources. You can sort them um, in grades or age groups. So if you know you're going to have a high school coding club, you can get really great resources for them or, again, pre-reader. Um, they also divide it up into different technologies. So if you only have Android or whatever, you can um, sort it that way. And another thing I love about code.org is they have a ton of activities that do not require a computer or a device. So those unplugged activities that we went through yesterday, they have a whole whole, whole collection of them here. And we've actually, um, we've, put, we've put a lot of them onto our online clearinghouse. So you can check them out there or come straight to the source where we found them on code.org. But I'm gonna go through Codable with you guys. Um, it's this one here, my kindergartners called it a maze. They didn't even know they were coding, but they're still developing computational thinking skills um, and in a really fun, really easy way. So you click into Codable, click on kids start here. And I, in a library setting or even a school setting, I did it with play without saving. So again, if you have computers that are wiped at the end of each day, just go into play without saving. Um, and it's your choice if you wanna play at home or at school, it's, basically the same. Um, if you want to save it, your patrons would have to create a login. I never did that even at, at the school that I worked with and I don't think that's necessary at all. Uh, but you start with the first world here, Smeeborg. <laughs> all right. And actually, was that the first one? That is not the first one generally. I don't know what's, okay, sorry, I'm gonna go back because that did not happen before. Let's start with, yeah, it's this one actually. It's, sorry guys, this was, it literally just changed into what I was doing before. Okay, so we'll start at level one. Here we go, back on track. <laughs> and basically, again, you don't have to know how to read. It has these great 
um, graphics that show you what to do. So again, if there's any language barriers, mm -hmm. um, this doesn't, this is very accessible to anyone speaking any language. And it shows you what to do. This is kind of the self-guided part, which you might want to walk through this with your patrons for the first level till they figure out what to do. But the concept is your little fluffy guy, fuzz buzz, <laughs> fuzz buzz, saying, yeah, yeah, is trying to get through what my students called a maze, but it has to hit every single star on the way out. And so you're going to tell them what direction to go. So first, to get to the first star, the only direction he needs to go is this way. So you're going to drag and drop your arrow, and that will get him to this arrow. So I ask my students, what direction does he need to go to get to the second arrow? He needs to go down. So you're going to click, drag, and drop. And then finally, the last one is to the right. Click, drag, and drop. And there, that is your algorithm. You just coded your uh, your avatar, and then you're going to hit play and see if your code is correct. Very, very simple. Again, my kindergartners called this a maze. They always wanted to play the, the maze game. Um, and you can just keep going. And the levels get a little more complex, as you can see here. On to level two. And I'll just walk you through one more. It's very, very basic. Um, it doesn't require any type of coding language. Let's see, we've got over, up, over, over. Go ahead and hit play. And buzz, buzz. <laughs> right, so very basic. Um, and if the kids do not get it correct the first time, um, I'll just show you really quickly what happens. That's all a part of coding and that's all about a part of computational thinking is trying again when you don't get it right the first time. So let's say this one's a lot more complicated. Let's say I go up instead of down and see what happens. It will give you where you went wrong and you can try it again. And if kids get frustrated, that's good. That's a part of coding. Um, that's a part of life. You know, when you have a problem that you need to solve, sometimes it takes more than one try to get the correct solution. So um, a very quick and easy way to get kids interested and starting to code, even when you don't even call it coding with younger kids. All right, so I'm gonna- I just wanna, Eric said, having permission to fail is so important. That's a yes. great point, Eric. Yeah, absolutely. Such a big part of the learning process. Yeah, and we talked about this yesterday, how libraries really are a very safe place for kids to try and fail and try again. You know, there's no grades. Um, this is just, uh, it's a fun way to start to develop these skills. Mm -hmm. All right, I'm gonna head back to our PowerPoint so that I can show you another resource that is for a little more advanced um, coding patrons. All right, so that's codable, really fun quick and easy way to get into coding. And, and again, you don't have to be a pro in Python to be able to teach these types of coding skills. Okay, the next one, um, I couldn't resist. I had to throw in a space one. This is designing a solar system model. This is more intermediate. It's still block coding um, where you're drag and dropping um, your code that's already written for you, but this is an introduction to JavaScript translation. So I'll show you that when we open it up. This again is self-guided, but it gives you do-it-yourself options. So you can follow the guided tour, but then you can also play around with it, mess with it, and create your own world. Um, I do want to point out, <laughs> this is very important, uh, this activity does not accurately depict objects in the solar system to scale. So I I encourage you to refer to our solar system stale activities archived webinar. It would be great if you did this in tandem with one of our scale activities that shows a much more accurate um, solar system that's actually to scale. Yeah, certainly. But when you, I mean, you'll understand why they didn't do it to scale when you see it because it would be impossible uh, yes. with how big the sun is. It would be impossible. I might suggest um, jump to Jupiter or mm -hmm. solar system in my neighborhood or pocket solar system as mm -hmm. some good options. Yeah, and those are all in our online activity clearinghouse. Okay, so I'm gonna open this up. I'm gonna do a quick change in my screen share. Okay, so this you can get to through um, code.org as well, or you can find it on Tinker's website. Tinker is another awesome coding site for kids. Um, so you go to play now, 
And this is gonna look a little more complex, but still very easy and self-guided. So over here, we have our screen that we are coding. Down here, you will see each of our characters or we call them actors or avatars. And each avatar gets its own code, including the background. And if you look over here, this is your um, tutorial. All right, so the goal for this is you're going to change the background, add background music and sound effects, program all the planets to orbit the sun, make the planets draw as they orbit, and add descriptions for the planets. Um, so I love this too because this could be a research project too. If you're adding descriptions for each of the planets, you'll learn how to code that and type that in. But before you do that, you can encourage your patrons to maybe look up one of maybe their favorite planet and find a bunch of facts about it so that they can code it into the program. And that sounds more complex than it is. Um, but I'll show you what it's already. So it starts already coded some of the stuff for you. So if you click play, this is what is already coded. They have Mercury and Venus <laughs> orbiting the sun, which again, this is not to scale. Jupiter is not bigger than the sun. So please make sure you're not reinforcing any misconceptions, but it's a great way to just learn some coding. All right, so I'm gonna stop what they have there. And you go down here to next, and it will give you very explicit instructions. So basically, I have it selected on the stage. So right now we're coding the background. And it tells you what to do. It says drag this block and attach it to on start. On start just basically means what happens when you click play. So we're going to drag and drop this code. And we're going to switch background. And if you simply click on the white part here, it will give you options. And I'm going to switch the background to space. There, I've coded my first avatar. I can go and test it out. So when you click play, now it has changed. All right, so, and it's just step by step. So that's the first part. Click next. Make the stage continuously play background music as soon as the program starts using these blocks. And again, they're already here for you. Um, later, when your patrons wanna customize it on their own, they can click on blocks and they can go nuts doing all kinds of things. But you start with the tutorial so you learn what each block actually means. So to, to code some music, we're gonna put on start, and again, I'm still on the stage here as my actor. Here is a forever loop, which basically means whatever is attached in this is gonna happen forever until you hit stop. And you're gonna say in the forever loop, we're gonna play a song, a sound. And again, just click into this white space here and you have some options. I'm gonna go with space music. And I don't have my audio hooked up with you guys from my computer, but Imagine some. Imagine there's music. some crazy space music playing right now. <laughs> All right, so I've successfully coded the background. So I'm going to move on, and now we get to start coding our planets. Um, I'm only going to do Earth because there's <laughs> there's nine planets that we don't need to go through, and it's you'll get the picture. But so now you can see it automatically changed it to selecting Earth, um, but you can go through and manually select who you want to code. But now I'm going to code Earth. And again, it gives you the codes here. So on start, I forever want Earth to move a certain number of pixels while rotating a certain amount of degrees. And down here, each, so this is the code that you will use for each planet, but each planet has its own specific numbers that you can mess with. And down here, it says for Earth, your code should look like nine pixels and you can change the numbers simply by clicking on it and typing and hitting enter the number you want. Earth, we want to move five degrees. And it's great if kids, you know, are unsure of what degrees are, you can kind of mess with this. But I want this to be five degrees, oops, not 2,520 degrees. Five degrees and the, uh, the speed of which it will rotate around the sun will be 0 0.08 seconds. And again, I got those numbers from down here. It's giving you very explicit instructions on what to do. Hit play. Now I not only have Mercury and Venus rotating, but I have Earth rotating as well. So basically, it's a self-guided tutorial. 
You keep clicking next and it will give you instructions on what to do until eventually you will have all of these planets rotating around the sun. They will each be drawing their own line and your patrons get to decide how thick the line should be and what color it should be. And you can eventually code if you click on one of the players, it will say its name and some information about it. So there's the sun um, and it walks you through exactly how to do all of that. Once you do all of that, the kids can go nuts. Um, once they've learned what each block means, they can go through, click on their avatars, code it themselves, really make it their own world um, or universe. <laughs> and the great thing that I love about this is it can be a good introduction to JavaScript. So in this platform, it is a block coding. They've already coded this for you. You simply have to drab, drag and drop. But if kids wanna start moving to the next level, if you click on JavaScript, it will translate that all into JavaScript language. So they can start to see, you know, oh, in blocks, okay, on start. What does that mean in Java to have on start? And you can see exactly what the code is in this particular coding language. Um, yeah, just another uh, great, easy, uh, self-guided um, activity that I wanted to share with you, just to show you again how easy and accessible these things actually can be. All right, I'm gonna head back to the PowerPoint and then it's time for go Girls Who Code. Thank you so much for that, Claire. I'm super excited to share um, some stuff about Girls Who Code. Let me do my video first. All right, let me know if you can see my screen. All right, I think it's still loading. All right, great, thank you so much. So my name is Ty Hutchinson. I manage community partnerships for Girls Who Code. So what that means is we're always looking to connect with library networks, nonprofit organization, after school networks to really share how Girls Who Code is working to close the gender gap in technology. Our Girls Who Code curriculum is completely free. Um, it's adaptable. It, our curriculum can be used as a standalone curriculum or it can be used to complement any curriculum that you, any STEM curriculum you already have um, in your organization. So today we're going to talk about why gender equity. We're going to do a deep dive into our curriculum so you can see where our curriculum is housed and how you can access it and then really what's next. Great, so why gender and equity? So the tech industry is booming. By 2026, there's expected to be more than half a million jobs available, making computing the most sought after in the US job market, with demand growing three times the national average. However, only 19% of students who receive degrees in computing are women, and, students who, and only 2% of students who receive degrees in computing are women of color. We can't leave behind the ideas and innovations of over half of the population nor can we shut girls out of economic opportunity represented by the tech sector. On average, tech jobs pay over 100,000 a year and we're looking to make that change. So who do we serve? So yes, girls are in our title for Girls Who Code. We do allow boys to join the club. We are not discriminatory in any way, but we do lead with a girls first leadership mission. So we are looking to serve girls who are underrepresented in computer science and tech fields in terms of race, creed, or background. We're looking to serve students who have little to no access or exposure to computer science and education in, in school. We're looking to serve students who are free and reduced lunch eligible and any student who really identifies as a female, regardless of gender assignment or birth at legal recognition. So now we'll just go into a little bit of our Girls Who Code Club overview. Girls Who Code operates um, on the premise of teaching our girls through the course of kind of like a career, um, cradle to career pipeline. Um, so we work with students from third through third grade through 12th grade, and then we have our alumni programming and alumni network. And I can share more about that with you later, and I'll be sure to drop a link in our chat. Our clubs are led by facilitators who can be teachers, librarian, parents, or volunteers from any background or field. Many of our facilitators have no computer science experience and actually learn to code alongside the girls. Um, and their club members with our comprehensive resources and support. 
So no fear. If you have no computer science background, if all you know how to do is get into your Gmail, don't worry. You can still teach your girls how to code. And you can even use this as a professional development tool for yourselves to actually learn more. So now we'll just do a little bit of a deep dive of what does Girl Who Code offer? So program logistics by age group. Our club programs are differentiated by the age group, as we mentioned before. We have our third through fifth grade curriculum, which is the unplugged model where students can learn the foundation and the basis for computational thinking, which will really set them up and get them ready to actually learn to code with our sixth through 12th grade um, curriculum. Our students meet anywhere from 10 to 15 weeks for one to two hours per session. And each of those, each of those clubs that are launched, each of those clubs receive $300 to use for snacks, Arduino parts, those little Spiro balls that Eric talked about, um, drones, robotic parts, or pizza, a pizza party for your club, just to keep them active and engaged. Our clubs can be, skill level can be uh, anywhere from beginner to intermediate or advanced. We, our curriculum feature has a Girl Who Code project focus, which is a year culminating event after students learn how to code. It's, our curriculum is meant to be project-based learning, and we have over 120 different type of computer science languages. So anywhere from JavaScript, C++, Python, HTML, and any other name that I can't think of at the moment. So now you're wondering, okay, what is the Girls Who Code curriculum focus and what does that really mean? So sisterhood is one of the most powerful bonds that girls can have. And we're really trying to make sure that we're building, um, building community into our um, Girls Who Code curriculum. So it's more than just learning how to code. Even after a student learns how to code and they realize, hey, I don't want to do computer science anymore. I'm not a fan. That's okay. We just want our students to try. And as someone mentioned before, Failing, failing forward is super important for students to learn, especially our girls. And we're also looking for our students to learn their, to understand what their impact can be in society. After students are learning how to code at the end of their curriculum, they will be able to create a really cool website. As you see here, we have Chatbot in Python. So you can see probably, yep, there you go. And then we'll show you more about the Girls Who Code projects that some of our students do. They come up with some really innovative things. It's super exciting. I can't wait to share more. So this is just an example of our sixth through 12th grade lesson plans. So our all of our curriculum is housed on our online platform called HQ. There will be no need for facilitators to download any software, to pay any hidden licensing fees. All of our curriculum is available for the club facilitator and the decision maker to access. This is just a preview of what the online HQ platform looks like. You would have your agenda for the day or for the um, club sessions that you're leading, your standard club plan, mini club plan. And if you wanted to design your own club plan, you are free to do that and use any of the countless hours of curriculum that we have available to design your own plan. But if you're more like some of our other librarians and teachers, you might not have a lot of time. So that's totally fine. You can choose one of the plans that's already pre-crafted for you. And here's an overview of what that looks like. So you can have your meeting. So the goal is to welcome everyone to the club. You have intro tutorials, which both the club facilitator and the students are able to participate in. You will, on your meeting too, you would find a focus and figure out, hmm, what does our club care about and what should our club create? Should we create a website that uh, lets people hear about different poems? Should we create a website that's interactive and really helping the students and the facilitator understand what it is they would like to create with the free curriculum? Meeting three, research, and meeting four, setting your vision, and then continuing to go from there. So as you can see, this is just a really quick uh, sample. You have five minutes for the sisterhood activity. So making sure that students are involved. Woman in Tech Spotlight, really great to share courageous stories about people and women in tech who are not just doing the typical coding behind the scenes. You know, people think about coders with hoodies on in the basement. Um, so really kind of dispelling those myths. And then about 40 minutes of self-guided tutorials um, to help students prepare for their Girls Who Code project. And then at the end of that, at the end of each club session, we're expecting students to uplift their voices and practice public speaking.
Um, so what's good is what good is it to know how to code if you're not able to actually present what you have taught your what, what you've worked on. Um, so here are some of our projects that you can see here and I'll trying to drop that in the chat, but it's not letting me right now. So I'll drop in a project gallery for you to see, but there's a variety of different projects that students work on. One of my favorite projects that a student has worked on was a group in New Mexico, I believe, and they were actually dealing with drought in their particular community. And students said, well, why don't we create a website that lets people understand how much water they're using and what does water conservation really mean? So the students were able to create that and it was very interactive. So anyone who went on the website can say, this is how long I take to take a shower. And then it lets you know automatically how much time you're really, how much water you're really wasting. So really making people to think more about the, the things that impact their society. So our impact. So as I mentioned before, we are looking for to impact the nation. We are international. We're in our seventh year. We launched over 6,000 clubs for the 2018-2019 year. 50% um, of the students in our clubs are from historically underrepresented groups. And our students major in computer science related fields at 15 to 16 times the national average. And the way that we do that is partnering with people like you. So we're always looking to collaborate with community partners whether that is a library, a, li a regional library system, a STEM center, the Space Science Institute, which we love so much, um, and a variety of different um, uh, nonprofit organizations. And if you are an individual club, if you are just one library or one school, not don't fear, you can always say, okay, I am affiliated with the Oakland Unified School District. I would like to make sure that we are getting the additional benefits that come with um, launching a club. So not only will each club get their $300, but if a club is affiliated with a larger partnership, there are, there's more incentive and more funding that's available. So we have here a lot of our facilitators. I see some people are writing in the notes. Well, ah, uh, I don't really have computer science experience. I'm a little bit worried about that. That's okay. Uh, Girls Who Code, we really try to make sure we remove as many barriers as possible. We have one of our facilitators in the Midwest named Bethany, who was hesitant to start a club and tried it anyway and found she had such great success. She had no teaching experience, no formal computer science experience for um, computer science and nervous if her club would be well received. Um, she took a chance and went from the first two meetings having two students in the club to having 23 students in a club. So coding is more accessible than you think as my colleague Eric and Claire have talked about earlier. It's much more accessible than you think. So what you'll need. So you'll need space. We're just asking that you have space to host clubs at a nonprofit organization. So that can be in a library meeting room, um, after and inside of the school community, inside of a community center, inside of a boys and girls club, as long as it's at a nonprofit space. You will need computers, internet access, and a facilitator or decision maker. What we provide, we provide you with the funds to actually launch your club, again, for snacks, supplies, or whatever you need. We have the customizable club plans, student recruitment resources, if you're thinking, hmm, okay, this sounds great. How am I gonna get students to sign up? Um, our free, curric or free um, curriculum and resources, and a club success specialist who's a live person that you as a club facilitator can reach out to and say, hey, I'm not really sure how to actually launch my club next week, or I'm having a question about Python or the like, how to get started. So this, I'll share this, um, whoops, I'll go back. I'll share this link with you right now, but it's really easy. Some of our clubs go through this entire process of creating an HQ account, filling out the club application, getting approval email, um, and they're able to actually launch, some people launch their clubs within two days. But this is a general timeline it takes to actually launch a club. I'm super excited about that. And I'll leave this on the screen so that you can actually access, um, take a look to see who is the manager of community partnerships for your particular state. And you can feel free to reach out to us and we can answer any remaining questions that you have. But that's all we have for today for Girls Who Codes portion of our um, 
our, of our, <laughs> sorry, our webinar. I'm super excited to meet you and not sure if we have time to answer any questions, but I just wanted to make sure I got all of that stuff out as quickly as possible. <laughs> well, thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Ty, so much. And sorry. Yeah, we did run a little bit out of time. Uh, as I mentioned, we, Claire and I just get so excited talking about STEM. That <laughs> um, for so if some of you, we will stick around for questions. Um, I'm just going to pop the survey in here really quickly. Uh, we would, of course, appreciate it if you filled out that survey and, you know, kind of told us some um, things that you could, uh, that we could cover in the future that would be really helpful for you all. I'm also going to pop in the certificate of attendance, um, and that can be found. Oh, Greg just did. He's we're on the Thanks, same Greg. same wavelength there. Um, so, if anybody has any questions, though, we'll stick around for uh, a few minutes and um, yeah, happy to answer anything. Yeah. This looks like a good one from yeah. Deanna. Mm -hmm. Did Deanna ask for anyone? Uh, is there a best practice for what age to be more explicit about the behind the scenes of block visual coding and the like? There was a mention of how students thought they were just playing a game and didn't realize they were coding. When do you start using that language? That's a great question. Yeah, um, I would say, you know, kindergartners or even preschoolers, they can start to develop these computational thinking skills. And I think they don't need to hear the big terms like algorithms and programs and coding. I think that's just beyond their verbal skills, but they can still start putting sequences together and their brain is gonna start figuring out, oh, to get from here to there, I need to follow these steps. Um, the first, when I first introduced the term algorithm to my students, it was my third and fourth graders. Yeah, I find, yeah, kindergarten through second grade, they're still just trying to grasp the English language. Um, and you can just, yeah, you can simplify it and they're still gaining those skills. Uh, but yeah, third and fourth grade is when I really start using algorithms, coding, they get really excited about the terms coding. Um, and then obviously once, once I got into middle school, that's when I really started focusing on um, other coding languages, introducing Python, JavaScript. That's just my experience. If, if Ty, if you have, um, if Girls Who Code has kind of a, a, a strategy for that, I'd love to hear that. Yeah, no, we are, am I still muted? No, you're yeah. good. Okay. Yeah, we actually are always just making sure that just keeping students involved and even asking their expertise. They know way more than you even imagine, you know, and they are always willing to troubleshoot. Um, and even if you're not really sure, like, oh, I'm not really sure how to use Python. Again, it's okay. You can learn together. And they're actually some of the best teachers that I've seen. When I go to visit some of the schools, uh, I manage partnerships, particularly in the Southeast. I went to Arkansas recently, and I had a student actually walk me through their project, and it kind of blew me away. And the student was 12, right? Uh -huh. Like, just had their 12th birthday, knew how to code and do everything. So, you know, don't be afraid to, you know, lean on the students for that advice. They're really excited to have that opportunity to really share with you and kind of lead with you. And I think in turn, that teaches students to really be collaborative leaders. And I think that that's something that is something that we're really looking for and really wanting our students to practice. And I think that that is super helpful. Um, and again, don't be afraid. Just try. If you don't know, be honest with them. Like, oh, I'm not really sure. Let's figure this out together. Um, and you would be surprised um, how, like how, like how you can really figure that out together. Um, so yeah. And then if you're still not sure, you can ask your club success specialist and they can answer your questions. <laughs> Yeah, and I just threw in there the way to how to start a girls who code club. So yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I would, my opinion on it is if you have kids that are like really super interested in it, I, you know, don't think about the age range. I'm kind of repeating mm -hmm. Ty here, but um, if they are showing a lot of interest in that like potential career path or whatever, um, yeah, throw it at them. Let them, let them use it and, and learn with them. I think it's a really good opportunity for librarians to be that guide on the side and learn with their patrons as mm -hmm. opposed to, you know, give, being the sage on the stage. Totally. And a great thing about the resources that we showed today is they are web based. I think most of them. So they can do this at home if they have Internet access at home, of course, um, or at school uh, during recess or whatever. These are things that they don't have to download an app. They don't have to have logins. They can do it anywhere, which really makes it a lot easier for the kids to take what they enjoy and take it outside of what you're teaching and develop it on their own. Mm -hmm. 
right, maybe have time for, I don't know, one more question, um, if anybody has yeah. one. <laughs> A few seconds. <laughs> See, Doug says, understanding yep. the logical process of CT is far more important than the particular syntax. Yes. But yeah, especially because exactly. that syntax could change in yep. just a year. In two years, yes, yeah, half of these languages might not even be used mm -hmm. anymore. So yeah, absolutely, Doug. That's why we started with CT Unplugged. And that's the point I really want to hammer home is computational thinking isn't just about coding. Anyone can learn these languages, but it's the thought processes, the being able to look at a big problem and break it down into smaller, more manageable parts. Um, that is what's going to help our kids become great computer scientists in the future. All right. Yeah. So I guess I think it's probably about time we wrap yeah. things up. Um, we will make this available on our, our StarNet archive page and our YouTube page. Um, yeah. And you will be redirected to the survey right after that um, or right after we close out. So yeah. just want to thank you all for joining. We were, we we're all buzzing today. We we're like, that was the best webinar. You know, the chat was, was so awesome. So we really yeah. appreciate you guys giving us that, that feedback and yeah major thanks to eric major thanks to ty yeah thank you guys so much really appreciate all of your awesome resources yeah. and you look sad to go eric <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right all right we'll see you well, later have a great day guys thank you thank you bye-bye